Hi, everyone, and welcome and good evening. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Leonard Mladenow, presenting his book, Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking, in conversation with Nick Auchar. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on Wednesday, February 10th, we'll host celebrated theoretical physicist Michael Dine for his new book, This Way to the Universe, A Journey into Physics. To learn more about this and our upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to our Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you might've missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Emotional on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and especially for science. And finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise if they do, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Leonard Mladenow received his PhD in theoretical physics from the University of California, Berkeley. Previously, he was an Alexander von Humboldt fellow at the Max Planck Institute and was on the faculty of the California Institute of Technology. An award-winning science writer, his previous books include A Briefer History of Time, Subliminal, which was the winner of the Penn E. O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award, The Drunkard's Walk, and Elastic. Tonight, he is joined in conversation by Nick Auchar, a writer, editor, and executive director of Advancement Communications at Claremont Graduate University. Previously, he was deputy book editor at the Los Angeles Times and regularly contributes to the Los Angeles Review of Books. This evening, Leonard and Nick have joined us for a discussion of Leonard's latest, Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking, a captivating plunge into the science of emotion, which Charles Duhigg calls beautifully written and full of cutting edge research. This book is a crucial reminder of the power feelings have in our thinking. Much of the discourse surrounding emotions is plagued with hard to answer questions. How can one connect better with others? How can one make better sense of conflict feelings like frustration, fear, and anxiety? Ushering us from the labs of pioneering emotion scientists to real life scenarios, emotional shows us how our emotions are essential parts of who we are, guiding our decision making and allowing us to have a stronger connection to the world around us. We are so thrilled to be hosting this event tonight. Without further ado, I am delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Leonard and Nick. Thanks, Benjamin. Appreciate it very much. Hey, Nick. Hey, Len. How you doing? I'm good. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well, too. Good, good to see you. And you too. Thanks to everybody for, uh, <laughs> for joining us tonight. This is, uh, this is really a pleasure. So as Benjamin said in, uh, in his intro of us, so a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was the deputy editor of the book section at the LA Times. And that's, that's how I came to be aware of, of Len's work for all of you out there. I just kept seeing these books rolling in with his name on it and him getting all these outstanding reviews. And I just thought, who is this guy? You know, what's, what is going on? And as, as Benjamin said, you know, Len has been trained as a physicist. Uh, he counts many of, uh, many of the field's heavyweights as his colleagues and friends, people like Richard Feynman and Stephen Hawking among them. But to say he's been a, a following a traditional route as a, as a physicist or a traditional academic path would be totally wrong. Sure, he's, he's taught at Caltech for a number of years. Sure, Len is still a practicing physicist. Hey, Len, I hope you don't mind this long windup I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a, been a practicing physicist. He's regularly published, but, he, but he's also written for television for many years that people might not realize. 
And when you read his books, you realize he's got a voice and a style that's totally all his own and has garnered him such a terrific international following. So it's it's really my pleasure to be here with you tonight, Len. You know, thanks, thanks for thinking of me and inviting me to do this. Well, thanks, Nick. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I, I'm turning red. Oh, really? I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, it's good. How, 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 how's I have it to control my emotions right now, you know, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Try to take the emotion out of it, right? Isn't that what yeah. it talks about? Um, how's it going? How's How's the Zoom tour been going? Have you had a chance to do any in-person events or uh, maybe something in the fall when things lightened up a little bit? No, it's all been started really early this time, uh, earlier than the in-person events ever started. It started in December, even though the book came out January 11th. And uh, it's been it's quite, a, quite a few stops on the tour, but I guess the publisher doesn't mind sending you everywhere when they don't have to pay plane fare hotels. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. It's fun. I enjoy, I enjoy talking about the book and the topic. Yeah, and we have, we have a, it looks like we have a terrific, a terrific group of participants tonight. And, uh, you know, and throughout this, throughout this uh, discussion, I'll, I'll keep checking the Q&A section to see if there are any questions that, that uh, I can pitch your way. Um, I wanted to start off simply with talking about the timing of the new book. So in my old world of writing book reviews, uh, it was almost a throwaway line to sometimes say that a book was like perfectly timed, you know? A new politics book would come out and you say, oh, it's just couldn't be better timed for the situation. Or there was a self-help or a history book that was talking about some particular issue that was kind of hot. And you'd say, oh, it's perfectly timed. Kind of ended up sounding like filler, you know? Mm -hmm. But when I talk about your book as being perfectly timed, that is hardly a throwaway. It's no exaggeration. Uh, the years 2020 and 2021 were total pressure cookers, pure emotion. You saw hatred, anger, and fear everywhere. Um, how did you cope with it? Did you find yourself getting caught up in all the craziness of those two years? Well, of course. Of course, I'm human, and I did. Um, well, I, 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 I coped with it. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book was not only to learn how the mind works and how emotions inform your thoughts and your decisions, but to learn for myself how 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 I work and how that would how that would work. And so I, you know, it was nice writing the book and be having my consciousness raised about how my brain works huh. to be able to reflect on on what I'm feeling and why and how I feel about other people and, and the, the events that are happening and um, and learning to use some of the emotion regulation tools I talk about in the book to to you know to regulate my own emotions when they got out uh, when they get out of hand because I mean I, I don't want to start by talking about emotions getting out of hand I want to say that emotions are uh, not only uh, a constructive uh, and important tool in all of our reasoning and our thinking but they're inextricable from our logical reasoning we can't get away from them and they and they help us daily many times as we uh, to guide us even to make us get out of bed in the morning yeah. so we need our emotions um, but just like your eyes experience sometimes optical illusions and mirages and so on uh, your emotions sometimes uh, get out of hand they they can be uh, sometimes you react too strongly to a situation or the emotions have a quality called persistence which means that they don't go, come and go immediately they they, they they linger for a while and sometimes they linger too long. You, you're in a situation where the emotion is appropriate. You go to another situation where that emotion is irrelevant to that new situation, and yet it lingers. And um, since our emotions uh, evolved when we were living in the wild, and we live in such a hugely different society today, this, these things uh, can, can happen. Uh, but f yeah. for the great predominance, I, I just want to emphasize of our living, the emotions are playing a very constructive role. Um, but it was a, and, and, and they've helped me get through these, these years too, because it's been a, a tough time. And uh, I think for all of us. So what, I mean, you said you, you had some practices that you used. I mean, so what, what are some of the things that, that you learned to use to handle your emotions during this overheated time? Well, um, one, Medi one that I'm sure we all use probably, uh, sorry. Uh, meditation, stuff like that, right? Well, that, yeah, and um, expression. So expression is, is, is talking about or verbalizing your emotions. Um, 
men in our society in the Western society, uh, at least in my generation and before, were taught to suppress your emotions and not show them and men don't cry and, and uh, oh, quote, overcome your emotions. And we were taught that females were somehow lesser because they were, they, they were said called more emotional, but really they were more in touch with their emotions. We're all emotional. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, uh, th that doesn't work, though. Suppressing emotions doesn't work, and it, and it uh, leads to bad outcomes, and it leads to actually shorter lifespan. So I, I didn't, I, that's what I don't use. But expression is one that I use uh, and learned, especially learning about the research about how well it works. I, I've come to use it more, but I remember my, I had a brief stint, you know, I've done, you know, I've done a lot of things. <laughs> and I had a brief stint in the corporate world. And I would get mad at some people that I had to interact with and work with. And, and I would write what we called in, in the corporate world, a flame, a flame email, right? So you, and, and I would do that. I would, and, and, but I would, I, I learned not to send it. I would put it in drafts and look at it the next day. And just the writing of that email was enough to diffuse my feelings. And same thing, if you could go home and talk to your, uh, your partner, your wife, your husband, the loved one, your parents, whoever, your friends, and, and it, just the act of expressing your emotion tends to, tends to diffuse it. So that's, that's one. And there's a fascinating studies, which I a little bit uh, long to get into, but uh, of social media and what happens in people's social media streams, which computers can now analyze and what happens to the emotional content after they express emotion. So we now know that this really works. Mm -hmm. And one other I'll mention, I don't want to filibuster, but I'll just mention one other one <laughs> <laughs> since you asked, which is um, reappraisals of one I use a lot. I like it since I live in LA, uh, I drive a lot. And in LA, the drivers are very aggressive. So sometimes something happens that angers you. Like for instance, you're cut off. It happens quite often. You're on the highway and you're, you're cut off by somebody. And we tend to get angry. And what, what are we really angry about? If you think about it, uh, I, I have my car falls back 20 feet and everything's the same as it was before. So nothing's really changed. It hasn't done anything, but you, you, you have a story in your head perhaps about that person that they're not respecting you. They're being a hog. They it care only about themselves, things that you, you, you project onto them. And so you have anger. And, and when your brain forms an emotion, that's what it's doing. It's, it, it, it's, it's taking in the sensory input and its knowledge of the current context and it's, and it's creating an emotional experience that evolutionarily over time has been developed to help us in certain kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, I, I don't think it's a useful one because there's no uh, call to action really that, that you wanna do. And there's no goal that really has been stood in the way that you have to over, you know, overcome something to, to get to your goal. You're just moving back 20 feet. So what, that, that, that way your brain constructs the experience of emotion is called appraisal. Reappraisal means to try and move that over somewhere. So what I'll tell myself is uh, that, well, that person is probably in a big hurry. Who knows what's going on? The person's probably stressed out. Who knows what's happening? Something emergency or just late for a meeting or I don't know what. And so that's why. And then if, I, if, if that's the story I tell, I don't feel the anger or I might tell myself, the person's just oblivious and didn't even realize they cut me off, which I have to say I can be guilty of too. So I really understand that one. So I don't get angry at that person either. So what you do is you take the situation and you try to consciously use your executive function in your cortex to, um, to find another story that's not the one that makes you angry, put a different spin on it. Now you can't, it's important that you don't, when you try that, it's, you don't just make up something that you don't believe. You have to find something, you have to, look at what else is plausible that something else that you can believe and just thinking about that and, and finding another spin for it can can diffuse your your emotion so those are a couple of the methods that i yeah, use I mean, that's fascinating so so you know we tell ourselves stories throughout the day so what you're saying is you you tell yourself an alternative an alternative story that's going to tamp down on those emotions whenever a car cuts me off i always tell my sons or something, I go, oh, that person's probably got to rush home to go to use the bathroom. You know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you feel better. Um, so there's, there's that typical saying, and I think you engage it in the book where people will say, okay, you're in a situation and there's a chance that you're going to get really emotional and you just got to take the emotion out of it. You've got to keep cool and just remove the emotion. But the way that you talk about it, it doesn't sound like you can't really separate one from the other can you 
No, so you don't have uh, an emotional brain and a rational brain. Uh, we might speak of it that way, but it's metaphorical. It's not uh, in any way physical or the way it's really working. The emotional and, and uh, logical processing that happens in your brain are in, inseparable. And there's no such thing. Even if you think you're applying cold reason, uh, you're not. Yeah. So how does, it, how does it work? Well, your brain is an information processor. It's not really an information processor like a computer, although it's, it's more similar to uh, computers as they're being used uh, just in the last few years with neural network programming and deep learning. It, it's, it's, it's something along that, th those lines, mm -hmm. uh, which we can talk about later if you want, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's also not that. It's so much more complex than that, but, it, but it's not a linear machine that, that, that takes in data and says if A and then B and you just go through and you make a recipe as a programmer and the, the computer and your brain executes it. It's much more complicated, but it is processing information. So what it is doing is taking in data and it's, it's trying to answer questions. And it, there's, a, there's a, a logical, rational part of your brain. There's a logical, rational capability in your brain. Your brain knows that if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. So there is this logical, rational processing that can go on in your brain. But that doesn't go on in a vacuum. So who chooses the question you're going to, you're going to answer and, and whether it's important? Your emotions. Who chooses which data, which sensory data you're going to pay attention to in any given situation? Your emotions. Who chooses uh, the memories that you bring up and the associations you make as you think about this or the goals that you're going toward? That's all very strongly tied to, to emotions and your unconscious processes that go on. So, be, so in any, in any, what emotion is, is a functional, they call it a functional state of the brain. It, it, it's a mode of process. A, each emotion represents a different mode of processing in which diff data, each data will be evaluated differently. Questions will be evaluated differently. Probabilities and risks will be, will be rated differently according to the, hopefully, the situation that, that makes it appropriate, that your emotions have evolved in a way to to tune all those processes in a way that you make the best decision and that ask the best questions and have the best goals and, and bring up the best information from your memory in a way that suits that, that situation. Um, let me just give one example to make it a little clearer. Uh, I like to give an example. Well, I'll give two, one, a quick one from everyday sure. life. You're walking down the street uh, and you're suddenly, uh, let's say we're downtown LA, parts of it are pretty seedy, right, right, Nick? <laughs> and uh, a little bit, you know. <laughs> and suddenly you're you're afraid. Well, what you're afraid, uh, a twig breaking a block away might suddenly enter your consciousness. That same auditory data would have entered your consciousness whether you were afraid or not. But when you're not in a fear mode, it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah. It's something that you have so much sensory data is constantly coming into your brain that we can't handle it on our conscious level. So our unconscious manages it. It's like when you're at a cocktail party and I'm talking to you and I don't hear the rest is just a din, a kind of a random noise until someone mentions my name, in which case my unconscious also goes, whoop, this is maybe important, pops it into consciousness. And I notice that, which proves that I've been kind of hearing it all, all along, but I haven't been attending to it. My conscious mind hasn't been aware of it. So that's what happens when you walk down the street. And so when you're walking down a normal street and you're not in a fear mode of processing that doesn't register but when you are in a fear mode then that twig from a block away registers because a mode that your you, the mode that your brain is working in when you're in fear uh, is, is accentuates your sensory input and has you pay attention to more things it's all happening on an unconscious level you're not deciding this it just happens things like hunger as a goal or maybe i'm walking to a restaurant they'll they'll suddenly be be uh, uh, lowered in their in their value and their how much I attend to that I won't even feel hungry anymore if I have a headache I might not feel that it's all being re everything in your brain all those um, parameters are being reshuffled to to suit a fear situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the, the laboratory study I wanted to mention was in uh, discussed because this is interesting it's it's not like the the everyday um, real world situations that I just described. This is a, a very specific laboratory situation. It's a bit artificial, but it also is very sharply illustrative of what happens. So when you're in disgust, scientists have found that that, that that kind of mode of processing has to do with increased propensity and desire to dispel things. So it's not just that I, I, I taste something and it, it tastes off and I'm disgusted and I spit it out. That's true for, for eating. 
but in general, it puts your brain in a processing mode in which you in which you value your possessions less and want to get rid of things. And so it's kind of interesting that they did this study uh, of, of, of students and they uh, put half of them in a disgust mode by, by having spraying fart spray in the room before they brought them in. Fart spray. Fart spray, yeah. Actually, it's I interesting. I don't know they, how they made that. They first tried, uh, if any of you are students out there, they first tried to disgust them by uh, having uh, dirty empty pizza boxes and leftover rotting food on the table and, and half drinking milkshakes drying up and stuff on the floors. And that experiment failed because they were not able to induce this disgust because that's the way the dorm rooms are anyway, or their homes, you know, their, their student housing. So, um, so they did the experiment again with fart spray. So that disgusted them. The other group, they didn't have them do anything. And then after they, they gathered them together, they had them each do some bogus, uh, activity that was uh, uh, supposedly the purpose of the experiment, but it wasn't really, but it was just to pretend for, for the researchers to have them think that that was the purpose. And then when they were on their way out, the researchers went up to each one and, and offered to buy back a pen that they had given them at the start of this whole thing. So that was really the point of the experiment, but they didn't want the students to suspect that. And the idea was that you, every, they all looking at the same pen, they look at the brand, uh, they have the feel of it, they get some um, economic evaluation of what that pen is worth, right? Yeah. But if they're in a disgust state, and they're supposedly, according to the theory, they're devaluing their own possessions, and they're in a more dispel mode, you would think they would ask less money for it than the control group that wasn't in a disgust mode. And uh, sure enough, that's what happened. I think that the average was something like uh, $2.50 from the disgust group. And four dollars and 50 cents from the control group mm -hmm. so this just shows you how uh, an emotion is uh, affects through your the, the whole framework of your mental calculations so it isn't uh one of the questioners rafael gonzalez asked a question about do emotions influence thought or does thought influence emotion it's all they go together right right so they 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 are in they are inseparable what's that uh, because to think about let's just think about it for a second Suppose I have a robot, uh, and I wrote for Star Trek, as you know, the next generation, and we had our robot data. Plan on talking about that. All right, we can talk about that later. But the, the data had no, supposedly had no emotions. Data was pure logic, and I'm glad that when I was writing that uh, for that show, that I didn't realize what I do now because I go, wait a minute, doesn't? Why would data ever do anything? Think about it. Why would data even ever do anything? Uh, you know, you're talking about thought versus uh, emotion. Uh, why would data even start thinking about something? What motivates you to start thinking about something? Desires, uh, a joy, fear, anxiety, whatever, right. some feeling. So if data were, were uh, had no emotions and data could be programmed with a set of rules, if Picard comes into the room, stand up and salute or whatever, right? Uh, right. Uh, if there's a fire, try to put it out or leave. They'd have, you could have an encyclopedia of rules of stimuli, possible stimuli that maybe nature would develop over a million years and they, nature would make you a dictionary uh, and put it in your brain and, uh, and, a, and a, an encyclopedia of responses. If this happens to that, if this happens to that, and you could live by that. And a lot of non-human animals uh, with simpler brains do kind of live in the, by such rules. Right. Um, but if you don't have, but, but if you had such rules and data was sitting on a desk, and none of those triggers happen, data would just remain sitting there and not, and not even initiate anything. And, and if something happened that wasn't quite, was new, a new situation that nature or the programmer hadn't foreseen, or a situation was a variation of situation, data wouldn't know how to do that either. So instead we have emotions, which are an extra layer, which are much more general. They're not, they're not triggered by such specific things they are triggered by a much more general universe of, of, of things that happen. And they trigger this, the state of being, and then your mind calculates. It uses the input of the emotion and, and the knowledge of the situation, your beliefs, your rational thinking, and it does thinking and thoughts and it generates thoughts and action. Yeah. So that, that's how that, how that works. So you can't separate the, the emotion from, from the logical processing. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, so one of a, another question from someone on this, on this session, Monique, she asked about, uh, for you to explain a little more about emotion suppression and shortening the lifespan and that sort of is that tied to the idea of stress killing people right that's exactly so so what suppression uh so 
psychologists have studied what how, how people cope with certain situations and, and, and the lowest on the totem pole in terms of success is, is suppression. And they have also found that what happens when you, when you do suppress emotions regularly and habitually is that you end up with higher levels of cortisol, a hormone from stress. And, and, and when they look at people, they find correlations between a lifespan and, uh, and the practice of, practice of emotional suppression. And they understand that because if you look at it physiologically, uh, suppression is related to cortisol and that's related to stress. That's a stress hormone that is not good for your body to have on a, uh, elevated levels on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, I, you know, I looked at your book as well, just to see what it said about social media. And, you know, I was thinking of, of what we've gone through the past couple of years and, uh, you talk, you talk a little bit about Facebook and the effect of positive posts versus negative. And you used a, you used a really powerful term that I've, I think everybody's been affected by. You, you use the term emotional contagion. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what, what was going on with social media and how that affected our emotions as well. Well, so humans in the wild couldn't survive on their own. So we banded together and in groups of 20, 30, 40, 50 individuals. And I'm talking about when we were nomads on the, on the prairie or the African savanna. Yeah. Uh, and that's how we survived. As primates, we're not the strongest, the fastest or anything, even, uh, even able to survive just on our own. But, but when we cooperate, we can catch prey, we can accomplish things, build shelter and be, become able to, to, to survive the... Um, all the trials and tribulations of, of, of raw nature. Okay. So because of that, we had to evolve ways of uh, cooperating with each other, uh, even before language, um, and, and certainly before written language and before culture, we had to find ways of, uh, of understanding what each person wanted, what, what, of, of communicating your thoughts to the next person in, in a way to, to, to uh, smooth out the, the operation. And, and also, um, um, we, we needed to, to learn to help other people, to want, to desire to help other people. So we developed social emotions and we have empathy. Okay. We have guilt for when, when we did something that violates social norms that harm somebody or shame when p other people are looking at us and going, you, you did something to harm somebody. We, we, if we, we, we cooperated with each other. And this emotional contagion has to do with that. It's a way of saying this, if your, your sadness is my sadness, Nick, so I'm going to help you if you're in trouble and, and you'll help me when I'm in trouble. And that's how we, we all survive. So today we have, uh, we still have that, that, that aspect of our beings, which is an emotional contagion that uh, I, I like to point out. My favorite example of that is the laugh track on, 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 on comedies or sit sometimes, you know, like, I don't know if you ever watched the late night uh, comics, yeah. like Colbert and so forth. And I used to watch them sometimes and think that they were funny. And then when COVID hit and they didn't have an audience and there were no, was no laughter behind them, I'm going, are these jokes just not funny anymore? Or is it that I only laughed because other people were laughing, you know, and there's something to that. And we all tend to share that. It's like when one person yawns, you all yawn. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. And so what has happened though, in modern society, we are in touch with so many more people than we were ever um, in touch with when we were evolving over the many you know millions of years that that, that we were evolving. Uh, we may have lived in a in a situation with our a family and a, and a group of maybe dozens of people, but 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 we probably interacted with only a you know some uh, interacted with only a subset of that, a dozen or two people in any given day. And today, what happens today? Well, we have of course first television and that, that the, the cable media that that we get input from other from many other people but with the social media and the internet now that's even that goes both ways now we communicate they communicate we're in touch many people are in touch with thousands and thousands of people every day and it's really not not natural in the sense that we didn't grow up our as a species we didn't grow up that way and we're not necessarily armed or equipped for for, for that no. So when, when a now emotional contagion, when it works on that scale, can really uh, be strong and get out of hand. So and, uh, hate and anger and sometimes fear 
going through that uh, through that massive social media uh, and um, reaching many other people can magnify and amplify in a way that that isn't necessarily healthy for for society. And, and yet, people can also use that to um, to attract eyeballs to their whatever TV show or website because that that excites people. And so it, it, it becomes a bit of, a, of an issue in modern society, I, I think. And, and there have been studies of social media that, that illustrate the contagion. You can see, yeah, they, they have a compu- really interesting computer programs that analyze the uh, emotional content of uh, texts. So they can, they can go through uh, millions of Twitter texts or streams, uh, th- hundreds of thousands of users, their streams and analyze the emotion. They can study how, what's happening and they can see when they do these uh, studies that they can see the spread of emotion just by analyzing how uh, getting some um, Twitter or Facebook feeds with certain emotion uh, alters the, the people who have read that to, to, to make t- tweets and they're, you know, along the same line. So, sure. right. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think on the evolutionary scale, I, I, know it's just, I don't think the human being is really prepared for, uh, for the intensity that that social media has uh, has provided, you know, over the past twenty years, I I you know I was thinking of your uh, description of emotional contagion. I was I remember it must have been right at the beginning of the pandemic. I posted something on my Facebook, and I, I posted about this this Catholic monk because that's my own background, the Catholicism, and about he posted this thing about how beautiful it was to walk into a Hindu temple and see all the people in prayer. And he said, he said something like, wouldn't it be wonderful if we all found common ground, you know, that we share in something in order to advance, you know, as a people. And I thought, oh, that's so lovely. I'm going to share that on social media. So I did. And I got a few likes. And then somebody flamed out on me and wrote like a 300 word reply, where they said, how can you support these primitive religions? And I was like, whoa (laughs) and it was it was awful and it was uh, you know i mean like you said it's this emotional contagion but it's it's in reverse it's like people aren't growing together it's like they're pulling apart don't you think well what what, depending on the emotion uh, happiness can be a contagion too in fact there's a very interesting study um a long longitudinal study long-term study over uh decades uh, of a group a network of, of people and what happens, it's a large uh, group of people and uh, they, they follow them and they studied their happiness in life and, and also their connectivity to other people. And they found that, that people who were socially connected to other happy people tended to have greater happiness. Uh, now you have to be careful there because I understand there's a difference between correlation and causation. And they, they took that, you know, they, they, they analyzed that carefully. It, what, it wasn't just all the happy people banded together. It was that people who were making more network connections and who weren't happy and, and started connecting to happier people, mm-hmm. then their level of happiness arose. So, so, I mean, it's not just bad emotions that are contagious. It's also happy emotions. And if you have in your circle a lot of happy people, that's, that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, if I was your publisher and I was looking to try to try to make more money off of this, Here's what I would do. I would take this book, Emotional, and I would take I would take Subliminal and Elastic, and I would create this box set of the three books to sell at the holidays, right? Because it seems to me like you've written this trilogy that's all about human decision making and behavior and all the things underpinning our actions that we don't even think about. Did did you originally imagine that you were going to end up writing a series of books that go in that direction? That's an interesting question. And I'm sure a lot of people would wonder, why is this guy who's a theoretical physicist writing about this topic? And yeah, yeah. what happened was I was back on the faculty at Caltech and I had a good friend named Christoph Koch, who a very eminent uh, neuroscientist who studied consciousness. And I got really interested in consciousness through him. Mm. And he invited me to participate in his lab, which I did for several years uh, in all their research seminars and talks reading the paper, their papers, reading many other papers. And I would sit in on courses. I mean, if I'm, you're in the faculty there, you can go to any course you want, any, you know, just like a student can. I don't have to get graded either. So I would, I would start going. I, and I, I just got, I ate it up. It was amazing. And what I liked about it was, it was the same curiosity I have as a physicist. As a physicist, I'm curious about the universe. How do we get here? 
How did it get here? Why is it the way it is? And then I have the same questions, though, as a human. How, how did I get the way I am? Why am I the way I am? How did we as a species get here? So I, I see that as kind of similar. And, and I tried to talk to Christoph about writing a book together. He didn't want, he didn't think it was a good idea to write about consciousness because he felt that that field was too much in its infancy and we didn't understand enough about it. Uh, but he said, why don't you look at the unconscious mind? And, and, and we talked about writing a book about that uh, together. We ended up that I wrote it, but it was fascinating because when I, the more I learned about it, the more I got interested in, uh, in that, in that uh, topic, because I learned that you, you, a lot of what determines how you think, feel, believe, behave, yeah, uh, it comes from processes that you're not aware of. I had written a, a book uh, called the, the Drunkard's Walk. And it's a math book, really, but it's a it's about society. It's called it's about um, how randomness rules your life, and it's about how we misinterpret a lot of the events of our life as coming from either skill or planning or whatever. And that and what a great role randomness plays, unrecognized role. And that was my had been my prior book, and now I'm going, wow, the unconscious is the same thing. There's something that people don't realize. They don't even know themselves that that's, that that's governing all their, their thoughts and their actions. And, and, and so I, I had a great deal of fun in writing about, uh, about that in that book and, and putting in the latest, I was really interested in the latest neuroscience, the neuroimaging techniques and the, uh, all the amazing new technologies that were allowing this kind of advances to happen. And so I, I just put the, all that into that book. And when, when I, it was, it was great fun and it, it, it was very popular and after that, I, I decided that, you know, along with these physics, physics, mathy books, I want to write more of these brain, brain books, mm -hmm. mind books, because I want to, I want to know about myself. So uh, Elastic is, is about where ideas come from, where, how we get ideas and create where creativity comes from and how we respond to change. Uh, I mentioned earlier, reflexive thinking that a lot of organisms can exist with this rule book of if this happens, do that. But they're they're vulnerable then to change when something their habitat changes, something happens in the climate or whatever it is that situations that they hasn't been foreseen, they don't know, they don't react properly, and, and uh, the elasticity in the brain allows you to be that adaptive. And I'm so I'm talking about all that and how that works. And when that was done, I I, I was looking for uh, um, wondering if there was any other aspect to attack, and I realized I had missed something. And that was the emotional side. It's not all, you know, uh, it, 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 emotions are just like the book on the unconscious mind, subliminal. Uh, emotions play a hidden role in our behavior. People don't appreciate or realize exactly the role that it plays and, and how it's helpful and how it can't be separated from rationality and, and how you can control it when you need to. So, um, so that was just a kind of bam, bam, bam. It was a natural uh, outgrowth, I think. And, and I have another uh, good friend at Caltech, uh, Ralph Adolphs, who in this book was as influential as Christoph was in Subliminal because Ralph does emotion research. So, um, and, and uh, so it was, um, That's very good. I was lucky enough to be close to him and again, get a lot of uh, good, uh, you know, getting steered right <laughs> along the way too. <laughs> this, this this is the thing about you that you're so self-deprecating and i'm sure people will call you re, you realize this too um that len is very approachable you're a very approachable guy len okay. and um you make it sound easy so you're a physicist and you're thinking you know what i want to write about behavioral matters i'm just going to make a right turn and do it to me that's like a dentist suddenly deciding that they want to be a brain surgeon you know it just it doesn't happen you know so where do you think you, you've drawn the confidence or developed the chops in order to go in an area that you didn't train for? I think I get the confidence from my mother. And uh, you know that I write about her a lot. I, I wrote about both of my parents. They, they had rather extreme experiences and dramatic experiences. They uh, were Holocaust survivors, uh, lost their family. Uh, my father had a, a wife and a child that he lost is in addition to siblings and his, his uh, mother um, and my mother had losses and, and they, they went through some really wild, um, you know, extreme experiences. And I had a very um, emotionally charged uh, upbringing, but 
with a lot of different aspects and dramatic stories from those days. And so it seems like when I'm writing, I'm always looking for stories to tell, to illustrate my point, to make it more interesting. I don't want it to be a textbook. I want my books to be something you like to read that has either drama or humor or interesting things in it that, that illustrate my points rather than uh, A to B to C kind of dry lecture. And so stuff always comes to my mind from my childhood, from my parents. And um, so um, my mother, though, one thing that she she was she was extraordinary in many ways, but uh, she was amazingly uh, uh, supportive of everything that I did and always telling me that I could do anything I wanted. And, you know, uh, raising me in a way where I, where I felt that I would never think of not succeeding. So I, I did so many crazy, I, I'm as a, on the faculty as a physicist, which I quit to, because to become a Hollywood writer, I mean, I wanted to, yeah. and uh, who would, that's so and so crazy. I had no reason to believe that I could do it because I didn't really have any, any other thing going for me than I thought I could, I, I always loved writing and I, I loved movies. I wanted to do it and that ended up writing for, Phil, uh, TV for about eight years, uh, for instance, yeah. MacGyver and Star Trek, The Next Generation. And um, and then I went, I went theater game uh, from there because um, uh, Windows was coming online. And I said, wow, this is going to be a lot cooler than these old text things we could do. Let's do that. And ended up eventually, uh, I worked for Disney for a while. I ended up as an executive in New York. And then when 9-11 happened, we, we were unfortunately involved in 9-11 because I lived right there. And I, I won't get into that now, but um, we had to, because I had two young kids, we decided to leave New York. And so again, I just quit my job and said, I'm going to write nonfiction books now. <laughs> and I had one that I had written on, on the side, uh, uh, but it didn't seem any particular promise that I would uh, be able to make a living uh, writing. And yet I just left New York, bought a house in LA and uh, been doing that. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, this is all crazy. But, but I think I, when I think about my feeling that, that uh, you know th that I can do these things. I, I just think back to my childhood, and I, I was lucky uh, to have a parent like that. And, and I mean, my father too. I don't mean to diminish him. I saw a lot more of my mother than my father because we were very poor, and he worked constantly. But um, yeah. but you know, I, I think I, I I just grew up with that feeling, like uh, like I could do that. And and yeah. if it didn't work out, I'd still find something. I mean. Thinking back, of course, I remember this happens too, you know, to what my parents went through. Whatever happens to me, it's not going to be one tenth as bad as that. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not worried about surviving. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I was thinking too, like you have you have such a good ear in, in your writing. You have you have such a good sense of audience and you're able to make these very nice turns of phrase that are, you know, funny. And 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 if if anyone goes on Len's LinkedIn account, you'll see people commenting on his different books and things and the things that he says. And it's just, it's very, um, it's very prevalent in all of your work. And I was just wondering too, if the writing for TV also kind of trains you to be a little more sensitive to a popular general audience than your academic training gave you. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, so that's and also a sense of pacing. It was a great, it was really great training uh, writing for TV. Uh, you know, we we had back then the shows I wrote for. We all had commercials, right? So they weren't all the uh, not quite the way we do it today with streaming. And so you had to pace it. You had to hit a certain high point or a funny point at a certain time, if it was a comedy, uh, before the commercial. <laughs> and uh, uh, I find that that uh, that 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 helped a lot. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it also helps that I find that sometimes I. Uh, uh, might have trouble understanding something. And so I can understand people having trouble understanding things. And so like maybe I, when I'm writing, I, it may helps me write more clearly. And maybe if I was too smart, I, that, wouldn't, that, that wouldn't work. So. Well, all right, I want to, I want to play a, a quick game with you inspired by someone my wife and I enjoy watching on Bravo, a guy named Danny Cohen. I don't know if you, if you don't know him, don't worry. It's totally fine. This, this is a, a little game called Plead the Fifth, okay? All I'm right. Gonna, I'm going to give you two choices, uh, and you tell me the one that you prefer. Uh, you, and if you don't want to choose either one, you, you just say, I plead the fifth. And it's, it's typically, it's a drinking game. So if there's anybody, you know, in the East who's <sighs> making little cocktails right now, anytime Len pleads the fifth, you take a sip of your, your beverage of choice. 
All right. Well, I might just plead the fifth just for that. <laughs> but I wish I got to. I would have known that. I wouldn't have had coffee. I would have had something else here. But I'm sorry. I should have let you know. You know, next time I will. All right. So this is very simple. All right. Plead the fifth. I'm going to give you two choices. Cigar or pipe? Cigar. Yeah, naturally. Uh, computer or pen and yellow notepad? Computer. Jeez. <laughs> so you're, not, you're not a writer on uh, pads of paper? Oh, trust me. I've been, I'm unfortunately old enough to have started that way. And I can attest to the fact that it's a hell of a lot easier with a computer. And I'm, a, I'm an incessant editor, too. And I'm moving things and I'm cutting and pick, basting. And you can only imagine what my yellow pads used to look like when uh, before yeah. it was a computer. So totally, I, I would not be able to write anything near the books I write now, which go through my own heavy editing, repeated, repeated, you know, uh, not just to uh, get it to sound better, but to make it clearer and uh, right. to, to make it more logical or more entertaining. I'm, I'm, I, I, go th I just kill myself doing it. I doesn't, okay. whatever I write, it doesn't come, uh, just come you know, through the fingers onto the page. So, yeah. so no way a yellow pad, sorry. <laughs> All right, computer. All right, next one, my, I, this, is, this one I'm really curious about. Captain Kirk or Captain Picard? Oh my God. That's a tough one. Um, wow, acting wise, so definitely kept, well, I won't even, oops, I caught myself. <laughs> I'd better not say that either. Um, oh. Are you gonna plead the fifth? Uh, no, I, I think I'm gonna say that I, I can't really choose. I, uh, well, then uh, they each have that. their own uh, aspects that I appreciate. So I guess I'll say, since I can't choose, I'll say, I'll go have a drink. I'll See? plead the fifth. All right, everybody out there, take, take a sip. <laughs> All right. So my next question was connected to that. William Shatner or Chris Pine? Oh, wow. Um, I, I guess I would, I would say William Shatner. I mean, I have to say that I, there's a certain William Shatner uh, um, affection because I, that Star Trek, the initial Star Trek was when I was a kid and growing up. And so I, in terms of the emotional connection, that's there. That's the one. Okay. All right. That's good. Uh, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings? Star Wars. Right. Well, the books are amazing of Lord of the Rings. Okay, so if I could, if, if it was, I don't, you know, if it was, if the books were allowed, I would take Lord of the Rings. But if you're talking about the movies, I would take Star Wars. Okay, all right, all right. We've, you want people have only had one sip of their beverage so far. Um, I, 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 I know, you know, as a writer, you have to be open. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's really good because some writers aren't. They're very like narrow and very, uh, you know, specific. Um, Isaac Asimov or Carl Sagan, both early popularizers of science. Oh, Isaac Asimov. Ah, okay. All right. This next one, I think you might not like me for doing. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or Stephen Pinker? Fifth, fifth Amendment. Uh, uh, fifth, <laughs> I'll take the fifth. the fifth. On that one. As okay. soon as you said Neil, I'll take the fifth. <laughs> You can ask me about Carl Sagan versus the Isaac Asimov. <laughs> now right. we're talking current, current stuff. Yeah. Everybody take a sip. Uh, yeah. And my final question, I think I know which answer it'll be. I don't know. MIT or Caltech? Caltech. All right. Yeah. And I, my favorite teacher at Caltech was one that says on the front, MIT. <laughs> and it says, because I didn't get into Caltech. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. That's but again, that's just... Uh, uh, when I say that, I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to uh, imply that I've made any, that that's based on any analysis or feelings about their contributions, just about where I had a home versus where I never have had a home. So uh, yeah. I feel more at home at Caltech and, uh, and in Southern California. So sure. Well, but to all you people out in, in, in Boston, hey, <laughs> come visit us. You won't go back. <laughs> <laughs> But so we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to, I wanted to ask you too, I mean, tell people, is it fair to say that if, if your book Euclid's Window had, had not had that title that you and Stephen Hawking would have never met? That, that could be. Uh, so I should have say why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I so I wrote two books with Stephen Hawking, uh, Briefer History of Time, which was a, uh, meant to be, he, he wanted to write something that was like a brief history of time, but clearer. And then I approached him after that because I thought that first one was fun about writing about his recent work. And that's what became the book, The Grand Design, because 
universe in a nutshell, briefer history, brief history. That was all about stuff he had done in the seventies and early eighties. And he had done a lot more interesting stuff. And so we did that, but how we got in contact was he, uh, he read that book, Euclid's Window, presumably attracted by the title. <laughs> also a book, I, I wrote my second book, Feynman's Rainbow, and he was looking for someone to write with. And he wanted someone with a sense of humor and somebody who uh, most of all understood physics. And he saw those books and I guess he, he liked that. And he had his, uh, his people contacted my people, his assistant uh, contacted my agent and asked if I wanted to write with him. And uh, of course, I was <laughs> thrilled to do that. And uh, that's, so that turned into those books and a friendship that lasted for uh, many years. I, when, when you got the news that he had passed away, it was, it, I, he, had, he hadn't been well for a little while, right? But it, it's still- Well, he hadn't been well for 50 years. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So, I mean, he periodically every, well, especially uh, in the later years, the last 10, 20 years, I mean, he had serious ailments at least once a year or twice a year, you had lung infections in particular. Um, but then, you know, as he started to reach uh, get 70 and get older, uh, he was weaker and weaker and less able to, to rebound. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you too, because it's a good way of also talking about the writing process with everything. You were still dealing with your grief over hearing that he had passed away and the New York Times suddenly calls and says, we want you to write a tribute talking about what Stephen Hawking means to you, um, you had to cope with a lot of your emotions then to write to meet the deadline, right? I mean, what, what was that experience like for you and how did you, how did you uh, get the writing done under pressure like that? Well, I, I don't think pressure and a deadline is good for the creative process because um, you don't, when you, create one of the little things I wrote about in, in uh, Elastic is how you have a lot of ideas come into your mind on a subconscious level and associations and ideas and they don't reach your consciousness and you have filters in your brain that take out the, the, the less conventional ideas and tend to promote to your consciousness the ideas that are more tried and true that makes a lot of sense but you don't get innovative that way you don't get experimental so you need to relax and loosen up and having a deadline is bad for that because it puts your brain in a more focused mode of, you know, if, if you think I got to get this done, you tend not to let me try this that I've never tried before. So anyway, read, read Elastic about that, but that yeah. is very, very bad. So it makes it tough. But all I did for that article, in a way, it was easy to write because they wanted a tribute based on how I, my relationship and how I felt about him and as a friend. And um, so I just kind of... Uh, sat there and let felt my emotions and and let it all um come to me and would just start writing like crazy uh my thoughts uh i had and th thoughts and, and i would just let it all pour in feelings mm -hmm. thoughts uh, memories incidents that happened uh anything and i, and I didn't worry about in, at, at this stage about making it into a <laughs> coherent article i just put it all out there um, and I don't remember how exactly how long I did that for, but I, I did that. Uh, and I don't, I think I only had a couple of days to write the article and, uh, and then when it was done, I, um, I looked at it and I may have even put them each one on an index card or something and, and then played, uh, you know, solids here. <laughs> so, you know, what, what order does, can I put these in? What leads to what? I'm pretty good at that. I have to say, or that's one thing that I find that I'm in my writing that I, uh, tend to, that that's good because I have a way of being able to put together things that seem like they're separate because in my books I'm constantly running into okay I said this but this is not an encyclopedia I don't want I said this and now I'm saying that and there's no connection between this and that we're just saying and now for something completely different every few pages I don't want to do that I want it to be coherent with some momentum moving and, and I found that I've learned over the years to do that and, and so anyway I did that and I shaped it and then and then I expand, uh, and then I polish and edit and uh, send it, I guess, to, I think, Jamie uh, Ryerson. Uh, and uh, yeah, and yeah, I don't know if I did another draft or not, but um, yeah, I made it. And, uh, you know, it came from the heart. So again, it's, I find that being open, I tell a lot of personal stories in my books and I, a lot of them are very emotional. And sometimes it's hard even to talk about them without getting emotional. Of course. And I found though that that's, um, uh that's why i think how you you should write and uh not just 
when you're writing, let's say fiction, but if you're writing nonfiction, that I try to write things that people can relate to and are related to their lives and have meaning for them in their own lives, even if it's physics. So, um, and you don't, you don't sit there and do the old grammar school lesson of, I have my outline, Roman numeral one, <laughs> two, three, Oh, three, I hate three. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't like it either. <laughs> is, that, oh. is, that how you, is that how you tackle your books then as well? Do you do you take this topic and sort of let it flow for a while and then? Yeah, I I, I look at the topic, I will study uh, the literature and the topic in this broad, open uh, a uh, a um, context or you know as I try to have as few uh, preconceived notions about what it's important or it's about or what's interesting and just sit there and i mean i can spend months just um exploring every different direction you know it's again it's the internet age i can do that i couldn't write these books like that at least 30 years ago but right. but i'll go on to the uh academic websites like google scholar and uh you you um you can follow uh, academic papers and you can see who who, who they cite and who cited them. And you can just explore that way and explore the field. And then I, in my mind has this huge universe of stuff in it. And then, then comes this period of trying to uh, figure out what's important and uh, interesting in where we're going and, and all that. And hopefully it's, I, I view it like a fog that then condenses into some droplets that are chapters, right? Okay. So then I'll go, okay, I got, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, whatever, 12 chapters, whatever the important parts are. And then, um, mm -hmm. and then I'll go, what is, you know, what is each chapter really about and how do they tie together? And when I get to that point, I send it to Edward, my editor, uh, Edward Kastenmeyer. And I said, oh, here's my proposal. <laughs> you know, uh, I want to write about this. Here's the, you know, and then, so the whole thing could be yeah. three pages. And, um, and then when I write about it, I'm totally free to not do that. So I, you know, I don't, I want to be creative and I want to, um, it to be fresh. So I don't want, I don't want to feel like that's an outline I have to stick to. I, if I find that this chapter is really two different ideas or, or maybe it becomes two chapters, or maybe I decide this is not interesting. Maybe it's kind of important, but not interesting. So I'll subordinate it and make it a section of another chapter or try and get rid of it somewhere. I feel I have to say it, but it's not that interesting. So let me do that to it. Or it's not that important. I should just ditch it in the first place or, or, oh my God, I missed this. or I missed that. Uh, you know, then I'll add a chapter or when I'll go, this chapter should be after that chapter instead of, you know, I, I, it just changes and morphs, but, uh, well, I was going to say, I mean, that's why your 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 books definitely do have this organic feel when 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 reading, you know that they they things progress more naturally than you know. There's some other writers who are just very rigid and stiff about the way that they organize things, and it's definitely not not the case with you. Um, you know, as we're as we're ra rounding it off here, Len, and and it's, it's, Benjamin has been putting in the chat a, a place where people can can go to you know buy this this lovely book and spend some time thinking about it have you ever thought in the big picture about um, the you know the the wikipedia comment about you know about you and about what your goal was as a writer did is there have you ever thought of your bigger overarching goal of what you've hoped to achieve with your books no, I mean, I, 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 I don't. I, well, I mean, I, I do for each book has the same thing. I wouldn't say that I have an over. I'm saying I wouldn't say that I'm trying to fill in a certain, uh, fulfill a certain goal with, my, with the body of my books, but they're all really the same about what I said earlier, uh, understanding uh, where, where the universe came from, how we got it, why it's the way it is, and the same with people. Uh, where, are, where did our species come from? How do we get the way we are? How, what what makes me tick? You know, uh, why am I the way I am, and what what is that? What is that even? How I am? So, I think for the most part, that's my my theme. And but it's not that I consciously. It's that's that's what I'm interested in. It's not that I I'm saying here's my life's goal, and I'm going to you know fill it in with books A through Z. You know, yeah. um, right, right. like Sue Grafton. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So that's a good gimmick, you know. <laughs> yeah. If it, for, for my bet, my recommendation to folks is the, your memoir about Stephen Hawking, it's, it's just, it's lovely, it's so compassionate, and there's such a, a novelist size for detail there. 
uh, that's definitely worth pe uh, people checking out. Um, New York Times said very nicely about uh, about emotional. They call they call this uh, this book uh, a stimulating new book that shrewdly considers the ways emotions influence our thinking, with compelling examples and attention to the latest research. So you've had some some quite nice reactions out there thus far. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm fortunate to have had that. And I, I mean, on that note, uh, Benjamin, I think I think we're at the end here. We turn it over to you. We could thanks go on. You know? Thanks for a great conversation, Nick. Uh, my pleasure, as always. As always. Yeah. Yes. Thank you both for this fantastic conversation. Uh, thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Please learn more about this fascinating book and purchase emotional at harvard.com. I put the link in the chat a couple times. Uh, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Have a good night, keep reading and be well. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>